All right, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome. Welcome to a live broadcast. My name is Greg Schwimm. I am a corporate stand-up comedian, also the host of the streaming TV series, A Comedian Crashes Your Pad. Um, this, again, is not a funny interview. Um, sometimes I do funny interviews with uh, interesting guests, but for those of you who uh, follow me on YouTube or on Facebook, we have a very serious interview and a, a continuation of an interview that I did last week with my friend and colleague, David Freeman. David is a former co-worker from our days at uh, WPTV in West Palm Beach a long time ago where we were both broadcast journalists. Uh, we have since taken different career paths. David is a and still is, I might add, a teacher at the Pachursk School in Kiev, Ukraine. He has been for several years. When the conflict started, I wanted to hear his story. We had, a, uh, we had an interview about nine days ago, and at that time, uh, David was in the basement of the school. Dave, I remember you said you felt safe. You had shelter. You had plenty of food, you had plenty of water, you had some students and some faculty that were there, and you said you could probably sustain yourself for at least two weeks or so. A lot has changed since that interview was done. So why don't you pick it up now and just tell me what, uh, uh, what has happened since we last talked? Well, Greg, as I said, we had plenty of... Uh life-sustaining materials. There's no doubt about it. We had plenty of food, plenty of water. We had electricity, um, stuff to keep the little ones entertained. But as the security situation began to uh, become more and more risky because the increasing frequency of the rocket attacks, the artillery attacks, and the, the planes dropping bombs, uh, it became increasingly clear that we weren't going to be able to stay there with uh, with children and with families and with some elderly. So um, on the the fourth, we decided to head to the border, and at that point, we weren't sure which border. In fact, is it looked like we were going to Hungary. Um, we started heading that direction. Generally, you just going west, uh, but uh, we ended up actually here in in Warsaw, Poland. Um, it was a, a fairly arduous journey. Um, we were in two vans, two school vans, which, of course, is a, a luxury a lot of people just don't have. You know, they're in very crowded trains having to uh, you know, be shoved together. Some people were standing up for 8, 10, 12 hours at a time, you know, packed in these car, train cars trying to get out of Kiev. Uh, you know, our situation wasn't, wasn't as quite as severe. We had to... Two vehicle, two vans, one car with, uh, was with us for quite some time for, you know, probably two thirds of the journey before they peeled off and went somewhere else. So, you know, it wasn't as as difficult of a trip as many people have, have had. And that I want to make people mm -hmm. understand that clearly that there have people who have had a much more difficult time of this than we have. But it doesn't make it any less intense. Um, it was a, a nerve wracking trip. And, you know, with many people. In a, in a bus, uh, you know, people get sick and, you know, there's crying babies and people have pets and it's, it's, it's not tourism. Right, right. Now, and how much time did you have to actually prepare this uh, from the time you realized that you had to evacuate? Um, you, you were able to secure vans. Is that something, how easy was something like that? Because again, we're getting back here in this country. Most of the images that we're seeing our people that you mentioned who are traveling on foot. Uh, we are hearing about, you know, exhausted families, families who have been separated, who are making these journeys um, and what they encounter. You said yours is, was not quite that harrowing, but how much time did you have to pull this all together? Uh, we knew on the third that we were going on the fourth. Um, okay. But getting the vans wasn't difficult. There, there were school vans. I mean, the school has drivers that they either directly own the vans or that we, co we contract out with somebody who owns that van, but the van is essentially ours for its use. So we had two school drivers who uh, were behind the wheel of our, our vans taking us to the border. 
Okay. All right. And um, were there people that did not want to go with? I mean, how, who, and also, did you have to leave people behind? Yeah, there were, uh, when, when I left, and I think the situation on school has changed since then. But when I left, there was a family of four who decided not to go, and they were uh, currently camped out in our secondary music room, um, you know, along with the guitars and the pianos and the drums, you know, they had camped out. Now, we believe that uh, they probably moved lower because that's a second floor room. They probably went down to the bottom floor, or perhaps into the basement if, if the, the population on campus dropped significantly. But I don't know if more people have come back. Now, the people, some of the heartbreaking people who stayed behind were the fathers who sent their their children on. Mm -hmm. And I saw that on your Facebook page. I saw you've been posting some photos and uh, there was one that was particularly heartbreaking. You had a photo of a four-year-old girl who seems to have uh, developed a friendship with your wife, I believe, right? And it showed your wife reading to her. And you said that her and her mom were able to make the journey and the father had to stay behind to fight, correct? No, he's a he's a guard at our school and okay. he stayed because of that. Oh, but he, he would not have been allowed to leave anyway because he is of fighting age. Um, had he tried to go to the border and leave, uh, he would not have been allowed to leave. Um, mm -hmm. He probably would have been through one of the many checks that we went through checkpoints along the way. The Ukrainian authorities probably would have taken him off the bus and, and, and had him go back or you know, immediately start serving. So uh, it, 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 there was no point in a, a man under 60 years old getting on our bus because they weren't <laughs> going to be allowed to leave. Mm -hmm. You mentioned checkpoints. Um <sighs> What is it like to go through a checkpoint? How many did you have to go through? What was asked of you? And was there ever a moment of uh, fear that maybe you would be turned away? No, the, the, the Ukrainian authorities were very clear and, and very supportive in getting us out of harm's way. But they wanted to make sure that, you know, the people on those buses were legitimate. So we would have to do a, a document check. Uh, pull out our passports. Sometimes it was just a, a, a military member of the force just getting on and looking at us, eyeballing us and then waving us forward. So, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. the checks were very, very thorough. Sometimes the checks were, were not more lenient, but uh, it, it was never the idea that, oh, you shouldn't be here. It's let's get you through and get you out of here kind of approach. Right, right. And how long, uh, you may have mentioned this, but how long was the journey totally from Kiev to where you are now in Warsaw? And did you do it continuously? Did you, did you stop at all? Oh, yeah, we definitely we did an overnight in uh, Venezia, uh, a, a kind of smallish Ukrainian uh, city. Uh, we camped or were were sheltered in the bottom floor of a building under construction. So that was that was pretty harsh. Um, mm -hmm. There were essentially no toilet facilities, just kind of a, a overly used uh, porta potty outside and you know for 40 people in the basement of this building uh but you know the the kindness showed to us by the people who organized this was was incredible they they had food for everybody and you know had warm beverages for us in the morning and so forth then we got up and uh that's when we realized we weren't going to try to get to hungry and we were being directed by uh some people who were coordinating getting a large group like us out of the country, providing us with different routes to take. And then we were directed to go to Lviv, which is essentially uh, the largest city in Western Ukraine, kind of the heart of a radical Ukraine feeling. And uh, we overnighted there again in the bottom floors of a building under construction. This one was a little further along and there were a number of, of working toilets and uh, actually a, a crude shower in the basement. So um, okay. and, and again, lots of food being provided by local organizations. And, um, <clears throat> you know, that's what I mentioned to you that I've seen the best and the worst of humanity in a week. 
Yeah, I want to get to that in just a minute. I, I also want to say, if you're watching this on Facebook or on uh, my YouTube channel, both of which I've put up the addresses there and the links, you can ask questions. You can ask questions of David. He's more than willing to take them. You can make a comment, uh, whatever you would like. OK, that's something we weren't able to do on the last one. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, you might not be watching it on LinkedIn because I'm getting some uh, um uh, some messages that the LinkedIn broadcast didn't uh, hasn't been working, but uh, we have other outlets, and of course, I will also be putting this up on both on all my channels afterwards. This interview for those who couldn't watch live, but feel free to ask questions if there's something you're curious about. And now I want to pivot back to what I'm curious about, where you said you have seen the best and the worst of humanity. We you've just described the best or some examples of the best, I think, when you talk about all the nice people who have sheltered you, provided you with uh, sleeping accommodations, food and so forth. Uh, you can talk more about that. Or if you want to talk about the worst of humanity, feel free. Well, you know, I don't have the access to a lot of the images that that you have in the West because we've been traveling and we've been busy. And we but you know, every time I do see, you know, I check my news sources, the horrific images of of the suffering caused by a man who's who is hell bent on expanding his kleptocracy so that he can steal more people uh, from more people as he's stolen from the Russian people, um, mm -hmm. you know, to enlarge his own personal empire. And so, you know, we've seen the 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 face of evil in Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. OK. And did did you encounter any of that in you know, you were you went from a basement to vans to out of the country. Um, did you on the way? Did you encounter any of that? Did you and did you see either passing anything, either destruction or uh, I, I almost hate to to guess at what you might have seen? I would rather you tell me if there was any atrocities or something that you, you saw firsthand. No, 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 Greg, we, we did not. And I don't want to okay. exaggerate at all. Um, no, but, I don't think you are. I don't think, I think there's enough that's been coming out of the, the country that this is not an exaggeration, but I'm just curious how, uh, you know, what you've encountered. Well, we, we were going in the direction absolutely the opposite way of where the hostilities are. You know, the hostilities are north of uh, Kiev up to Kharkiv, you know, which has been just hammered. And then, of course, it's east and then to the southeast. So generally going straight west is the safest direction. It's also the... Um, it's it's going well. One of the things that we did see that was that was heartwarming was the absolute stream of these big freighters, these lorries coming across from Poland. I mean, they would be twenty of them in a row, just screaming the other direction. And you know, you know what's in those cargo bins, and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully it can make a difference. I see. Okay, now. How long do you plan to stay? And I, this is a very open-ended question because I'm sure you don't have a definitive answer for anything that I might ask you as far as uh, the future. But tell me a little bit about you know your your accommodations now. You mentioned earlier. How long do you think you plan to stay there? What is your next move, or is there one? Well, um, the hotel that we're staying at, I think I, I told you, is a kind of is basically one step up from a hostel. But I mean, we are comfortable. We have our own room. Um, we have our own shower and, and toilet, which is a huge relief. Um, and we have this place. It's booked for a month by an organization that uh, if we leave, they'll put somebody else into it. Now, essentially, mm -hmm. what in, in my mind is my plan at this point is to stay long enough here so that I know that this group that came across with us has been connected with the Polish authorities that will support them, uh, that will, uh, they, they get connected. Like we've already got one of our students enrolled at a school. We've got several more going to be enrolled in that school. Uh, if I can get people settled and I, and I feel comfortable that, you know, they're not real distressed, then I'll try to get my wife to the States. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your, your wife is, is, is with you now though? Yeah, she is, but she, she's a Ukrainian and we don't have a U.S. Mm -hmm. visa. So we're trying to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, I should mention, we also talked a little bit off, uh, off air before we started your school in Ukraine, Pachursk mm -hmm. is still operating virtually, right? Their, their students are still enrolled. They're still getting lessons. 
right? Yeah, they are. I I won't be delivering lessons for a few days because I'm thoroughly occupied here with this group. But uh, and mm -hmm. a, a shout out to uh, Alexander Best, um, a co-worker of mine. He teaches parallel courses with me. And so he's picked up my kids and great. Um, but yeah, we're offering courses online. And but, you know, that's that is something we're used to doing over the last two years of COVID. I mean, teaching online, it's not ideal. Um, but we know how to do it. And so right. that's what we're doing right now is keeping kids engaged. Uh, we also mm -hmm. are affiliated with some other organizations that have shown extreme flexibility for us. The International Baccalaureate, we offer their diploma program to our students in grades 11 and 12. And, and they've been very helpful and cooperative in, in making accommodations for our kids who are just trying to finish high school and get on to university. So, mm -hmm. um, the school is still continuing to operate. You know, it, it will be a very long time before there's any kind of idea of having school on campus, but it's certainly, we haven't given up on that idea by any stretch of the imagination. All right. The, the words you, you mentioned in your previous, uh, the previous question I asked you about you, you are in this hotel and they, you said, when you leave, they will replace you with, somebody else. Um, is there, what we're hearing now, the, the words that, and the phrases that we probably weren't hearing nine days ago when you and I talked are refugee crisis, humanitarian crisis, uh, stories about hundreds of thousands of, of uh, uh, Ukraines that want to come over the border and uh, Poland being one of the countries that is accepting them. But at some point is there talk of we can't handle anymore. Well, isn't that essentially a, the war on Europe? I mean, that is what Putin has done is he is is hammering Western Europe with uh, well, Central Europe with uh, a, a refugee crisis. And uh, that, that's a war. Um, so mm -hmm. you, you can call it what you want, but a refugee crisis uh, that is uh, instigated by a, an aggressor war is a war on the country that's having to receive those refugees. So what I understand, and, and uh, the, uh, the director of the school that's providing so much support for us, he is saying that, you know, we're accommodating these kind of situations now, but we expect this to get a lot bigger. You know, we've got more facilities we'll be turning into, you know, sleeping areas for people and so forth. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, people here expect a lot more. And polls, they are really stepping up. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like it from everything we uh, I have read and all the images that I have seen. Uh, we also should mention, I, I asked you in our previous conversation nine days ago where you get your news from. You mentioned BBC and Al Jazeera were your two primary sources of information. Over here, we tend to gravitate towards maybe to either CNN or to Fox News or to MSNBC. I would say that those are probably the primary three um, uh, other than maybe network news, but as far as that are on 24 seven. Now let's kind of pivot a little bit into, uh, into politics and into how this war is being perceived, because I think it might be a little bit different than it was nine yeah. days ago. And I'm a little curious. Um, I, I think over here, you know, we have, we have imposed economic sanctions, not as stringent as some would like. Some are saying, when are we going to cut off uh, Russian oil? And uh, like that's the, which we have not done yet. Uh, we also have, uh, obviously, NATO has been given the green light to uh, by countries to send planes. Any country can send planes over to you. But I think an awful lot in, in this country, that is once we start equipping Ukraines with military supplies, vehicles, that kind of thing. Now we are basically saying we are joining the war. And I, I feel like in a way it's sort of a chicken versus the egg type of a thing. I know Vladimir Putin, how far will he push us before we say, okay, we can't do anything else. And I think that's going on. I don't know if you agree with that, um, uh, with that hypothesis, but you know, what is your feeling about that? And how do also Ukraines feel about what they're seeing in this country, I'm sorry to ask a question on top of a question, but uh, your president Zelensky is basically saying 
the, the news that came out yesterday was him saying, we need more. You have to step up more than you've already done. Well, you know, I, I don't have a pulse on what the average Ukrainian is thinking right now. You know, one, I'm, I'm not Ukrainian, don't speak the language. And two, you know, I, I'm, I've been busy the last four days going the opposite direction. Um, but, you know, the, 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 what I hear um, and I've repeated to you is that the war between the Russian Federation and NATO is underway. It has started. Russia has a head start. And eventually NATO will have to engage. And it depends on, you know, do you do it now or do you wait? And I, I think the idea is somehow waiting uh, is a better approach. But, you know, I, I would say, well, OK, more Ukrainians die while you wait to make that decision. The decision that you will eventually make because something's going to happen to spill over into Poland Somehow, some way, Poland gets engaged and then NATO's engaged. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I just think it's a matter of time. And it's I hope there's some really good strategic thinking going on on the part of U.S. military on how to win this and win this quickly, because, you know, no one wants a long, bloody war in Europe. Certainly I don't. But I think it started. Yeah. OK. And the resolve of the Ukraine, the Ukrainian people, has that changed at all? You you mentioned in our last conversation about they were how determined they were and they are in this and they really think they can they can prevail. Um, has anything changed? Even you said you can't speak for the Ukrainian people, but yet you're traveling with some. Um, and, you know, what what do you talk about at night? Well, you know, there is the, you know, everybody that I was traveling with still is in contact with somebody who was left behind, somebody who's still in, in a village or a town or in one of the big cities. And uh, my wife has friends who are still manning checkpoints in downtown Kiev, you know, so mm. uh, people who... Which is becoming a very hot spot now, right? I mean, yeah. it is started on the, right? It started kind of on the perimeter and yet... What we're hearing is it's moving closer and closer, the conflict into the downtown area, correct? I, you know, again, I, I haven't been watching and following right. news coverage uh, as, as probably as closely as you guys have, because we've been, you know, mm -hmm. occupying ourselves with, with other things. But, you know, I, there are still people who are, who are, who are staying in the fight. You know, we've, we've got um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, a Russian teacher, she is decided to, to stay uh, working on making, helping to make uniforms and, and mm -hmm. provide material support for people who are actually still fighting in the city. So, um, you know, people are not running away from what I can tell. But, you know, they're, they're going to try to hold their capital as long as they possibly can. But, you know... A lot of people think that, well, if Kiev falls, the war is over. And my response to that is no. I mean, that's that's yeah, you take a city. It doesn't mean that you have won the war. You know, there is still right. a vast amount of Ukraine to the West that is completely unoccupied. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the resources. Can which come is the direction you went. Right. You yes. mentioned that that's the direction that you headed and with without any any issues. Yeah, I mean, it's still unoccupied Ukraine. And so therefore you can, you know, a lot of weaponry, a lot of soldiers, a lot of volunteers can come across the border and engage. So, um, you know, it's I, I, I know that it's 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 seen as pivotal that that the capital is held. And I certainly hope it is. But if you if if Kiev falls, it doesn't mean that the war is over. OK. Um, are you surprised that in, in a pleasant sense that it hasn't fallen yet? Well, I think, yeah, it's surprised to to somewhat but extent. But certainly I think the Russians are even more surprised. The fact is they, you know, all this all the crap that they tried to promote that, oh, you know, the, the Ukrainian uh, military is ineffective. It'll roll over. They'll surrender. They don't want to fight us. They want they want our leadership anyway in the world. Everybody everybody knows that was a bunch of crap. But what people really found out that the Ukrainian military was is is really punching back very very hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, tell me what you think. And again, if you you don't have to answer this question, but um, Vladimir Putin's biggest strength and his biggest weakness at this point. 
I think his biggest strength and his biggest weakness is 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 is, is his inner circle. You know, at what point mm -hmm. will these extremely wealth wealthy people who have organized themselves into this, you know, this essentially, like I said, I like to use kleptocracy as, as the way that the Russian government is. And these, these people at the top who have, have stolen for so long, but now that you really start to hammer them hard economically, they'll start looking at each other and going, why are we having to suffer for this man's ambitions? Because these oligarchs are, are going to be made poor and uh, mm -hmm. either poor or dead, either one I'm fine with. Uh, as long as we get that accomplished, I think I think that's where his greatest weakness is because his people can try to rise up against him, but they'll just be gunned down in the street. I mean, that's that's kind of Russian 101. You know, you people mm -hmm. up raise a fuss, you kill them. Um, so hopefully, uh, one of his the inner circle will decide that enough's enough, and they'll pay somebody enough money to solve that problem. But I, I'm not holding out for that. Right, which I think is still what we're thinking is going to work over here with the economic sanctions. You squeeze them for their money, and eventually, you know, the, the we ruin the economy, and that will be the end of it. And like you said, that that remains to be seen. Obviously, so we're still obviously in kind of a wait and see game. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's it's the people though who really get hurt the worst. Of course, are going to be the average Russian person. I mean, they're going to get. Uh, squeeze yes. the hardest and and that's that's unfortunate but that's again that's part of russian history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your your president um zelensky has almost <laughs> obtained uh, uh he, he has been he, he's almost he has elvis like status all of a sudden over here because i think in general uh because um and a lot of that i think is social media driven just because of you have a uh, um uh someone who and became president with no political experience, uh, was an actor, was a comedian. And I certainly could not run a country. So I, my hat's off to him. We're both comedians, but I never would think I could run a country. Um, do you still feel that he deserves the accolades that he is getting um, from around the world? Yeah, because he's standing up to a bully. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There you, you go, know, right there. It's, it's, right. Yeah. it's pretty okay. much it. All right. Yeah. Let's uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about I know if you'd like to give a shout out to maybe some of the organizations uh, where people can donate. Um, I maybe you don't have them off the top of your head. One thing that is getting a lot of press over here is that a lot of people are renting Airbnbs in Ukraine and not staying there. They, they have no intention of they're just paying uh, for people who who have Airbnbs as their way of donating and, and trying to help the, the Ukrainian people. So they're reserving Airbnbs that are in the Ukraine, and yet they're like, but we're never, we're never gonna show up, but please take the money. Um, that's some, kind of a creative way, and I'm sure there's better ways to donate, but I mean, tell me about some of the, the organizations that you've come across that maybe uh, people watching this uh, could donate to, can support, uh, can learn more about. Uh, you know, probably one of the fastest ways is to, you know, see if they can connect into the Ukrainian communities in the cities in which they live. Um, you know, there's there's a big one, I do believe, in Chicago. Uh, there's large Ukrainian communities, certainly in Canada, I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and, and find out how that money can go to, you know, groups that are trying to get people out. I will do my best to, to come up with some uh, uh, locations for people can help. And I know people are desperate to do it. You know, I, I, I had several comments from me. It says, before you talk to Greg tonight, make sure you've got some stuff because people want to know. And, you know, I did spend some time getting some messages out, you know, where can I have people send their money? And, and I promise to do that in the next day or so is get that information available for people. Um, what I'm trying to do is track individual families that I know of, um, you know, where the kids who may have departed a couple of days earlier than we did, you know, where are these families? How can we get some money to them? So, you know, what I may do is also just provide some kind of uh, opportunity for people to, to uh, you know, connect one-on-one -on -one families and say, you know, how do I get money in their pocket? Because, you know, that is, that's important. Uh, one of the things that uh, I ran into today, though, was uh, I couldn't change my Ukrainian currency here at a local kiosk. Um, I don't know if 
it, I, I can't blame a local kiosk for not wanting to take Ukrainian currency, but I'll go to a bank and find out what I can do on that. But, you know, the, the, the money that really talks and works is going to be either a euro or a dollar. Those are the, what will be able to go the distance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now that you're safe and settled and so forth, can you just kind of walk me through a typical day? What is, I mean, maybe you haven't had a typical day. Maybe you haven't been there long enough, but uh, uh, do you feel like you and your wife can now just go out for some fresh air? Is there, um, uh, or is all your time spent, as you said, taking care of the people that you were charged, whether it's students, whether it's other faculty members, you 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 seem to have taken on kind of a a, a big brother type of a uh, of an approach. Basically, from what you've said, I mean, is is your day spent making sure that everybody else is safe and comfortable and uh, not scared? I mean, what are you doing? Well, no, I mean, uh, you know, we were on the road all yesterday, um, mm -hmm. and last night I think we got to the ho got checked in maybe eight or nine o'clock we we got a first real night sleep in a long long time um mm -hmm. and then actually had a, had a normal you know late breakfast and and then we uh we were picked up by by the the wife of a, a military contractor who's here currently and she uh took us around to do some errands. We were, you know, we we're, we we're out of clothes. We had, we had one change of clothes on us. And uh, so we went clothes shopping. And so we went mm -hmm. to a mall, which was kind of a weird experience because, you know, to walk around and see people doing normal things, you know, just mall shopping. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Shopping. shopping. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you know, that hasn't been part of our reality for, for at least a couple of weeks. And so that uh -huh. was kind of, it was kind of an unusual experience, but a very welcome one. And uh, yeah. then we went and, oh, you know, stuff like trying to get a Metro pass for the subway system here, because, you know, chances are we'll be here for a month. So I'm going to try to make that work. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. You, so you that's, said, yeah. 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 You said gonna, you'll be here for a month. I think so. Uh, tomorrow is uh, we're having a meeting where we're trying to get all of our folks who came in with us on this trip and also supplying the link to any other Ukrainian families uh, um, who are, you know, connected to a school who left earlier, who are in other like down in Krakow to join in and make sure that our human relations department at school is going to make sure that they're connected with the uh, uh, Polish uh, government authorities to make sure that we get all of our people connected and into the system so that they get registered, they get the support they need. So that's something that our human relations department uh, will be doing tomorrow, holding a Zoom for uh, people who will be at the campus where we are and then also other at other locations in Poland so that we can we can get additional support to them. You asked me earlier if I had a shout out. I have a huge shout out to the American School of Warsaw. Uh, they have been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely phenomenal. Okay. People getting us situated, helping with logistics, getting across the border, got the bus lined up for us to pick us up on the other side, had food waiting for us. And once we then got to school, there was also food. They had uh, you know, everything down to child car seats ready to go for, you know, their people who would be taking us to their homes. If they didn't have a car seat, school already had a car seat for them. I mean, it was that level of organization that these people have shown. That's amazing. That's, that's unbelievable. I'm going to put right now up, I'm going to uh, uh, put the website of the American school um, of Warsaw up right here. So uh, let's take a look. So if you want to, if, if anybody's watching and wants to go to that website and find out a little bit more about what they're doing, if there's a way you can donate to them, anything like that, um, there's the website right up there. Um, all right, David, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I, I would like to ask you one more. Well, there's actually, there's two more questions because I started to ask this when you said you would be here for a month. Um, to me, that implies that you think you will eventually be going back to uh, where you live in, in Kiev. Is that a true statement? Well, you know, if it were safe and under Ukrainian control, uh, I would go tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think that will ever happen? Yes. You do? 
Okay. Sooner or later, right. sooner or later, it will it will simply be too hard and too costly for the invaders to permanently occupy Ukraine. They can't do it. They don't have the numbers and the more soldiers they tie up here who get killed and go home in body bags, the more and more resistance there will be growing, let alone from the populace, but from the people who are making money. So um, yeah, eventually it will, it will end up back in U Ukrainian hands. And I think mm -hmm. it will be the end of Vladimir Putin. Okay. All right. And I think there's an awful lot of people around the world who hope that you're correct on that. Let me uh, end with one more question. Do you have any, just a particular story that you can share something that you saw? Let's make it a good one. Um, you know, we talked, you, you, we've sort of spoken in generalities before about you've seen the best and the worst and so forth. Is there one, I mean, I obviously, I loved that picture of the, of that we referred to earlier of the four-year-old girl and getting the book read to her by uh, your wife. I, I, at least I think the wife was reading, your wife was reading the book. Maybe it was the other way around. I don't know. But, you know, we always, we always hear about the children. Um, you know, you're, you just said that one of the first things you were going to do is make sure that the school was up and running and that the, 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 the kids that you brought were registered with school so they could continue an education and, and, and the Pachursk school where you teach is still online. And, and, and uh, you hear so much about how this is affecting children. Is there something that you might be able to share um, or something that you say to kids that you're either with or from around the world that need an understanding of this conflict? You know, I really don't have, a, a, you know, some kind of story or uh, antidote that I've experienced, but in the totality of it is, you know, there, it seems like every generation has its, its proving point, and this is our proving point. And, you know, I hope we're worthy of, of past generations in carrying forward with the, the torch of freedom. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. And that's how that can be explained. I think to I, I, obviously that has to be explained differently, depending on uh, uh, the age of who you're talking to. But uh, certainly, I think around the world, uh, what you said, people agree with that uh, in one form or another. Obviously, you're going to have different uh, different ideals and ideologies and so forth. But I think the world is, would you say it's safe to say that the world is with you? Do you feel that way? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've had people comment that they've never seen uh, the West so galvanized uh, in its approach to uh, this. You have, you have to go back to the Second World War to find mm -hmm. this kind of level of commitment on the part of people to stand for what is right. But, you know, people will. And to think about somebody other than themselves at some point, too, which I think uh, uh, is something that we struggle with oh, now. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's it, not taking place where I live, so why should I be concerned about it? Yeah. Actually, Greg, I'm wearing a T-shirt that was given to me by the, the American School of Warsaw, and, and what it says on it is, um, I'll read the one they gave to my wife. It says on it, it says, um, <clears throat> belong to something bigger than yourself. Belong to something bigger than yourself. It's, uh, belong to something bigger than yourself. I love it. I yeah. love it, and that is a great right. way to, I think, to end our end our interview. Because uh, I'm, I'm sure you have nothing going on uh, <laughs> at this point. It certainly didn't sound like it. Uh, and I would like to say that we have been trying to set something up, but after we talked uh, nine days ago, I said I definitely want to do a follow up. And you were all in favor of doing that. And then, of course, we've been trying to set something up for about the past three days, which have been just filled uh, on your end with just, you know, it, the fact that you're able to sit down and uh, uh, and chat with me uh, and, and keep people up to date uh, and bring a perspective of somebody who's not a news person. Uh, I thank you so much for what you're doing. It's fascinating and I wish you the best and I hope that you're safe. I hope that your family, that your wife is safe and all the, uh, the children and the faculty members that are traveling with you are also safe. And uh, um, let's, uh, let's stay in touch. Okay. If you want to do another one, I mean, the, the situation is changing, but as long as you're, uh, you feel safe and, and willing to come on and talk to people, I'm willing to, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm willing to, to listen. Okay. okay. I look forward to right. doing this again, Greg. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. We'll see you. All right. See you. Bye.
And that is uh, David Freeman. So you can find David Freeman on Facebook. Uh, you, if you want to follow him, be and you can hear some of those uh, those questions that uh, or see some of those images uh, and some of his thoughts about what's going on. Um, just David Freeman on Facebook. There's probably a lot of David Freemans, but uh, eventually you will uh, find him. Um, again, David teaches at the Pachursk School Ukraine. If you want to Google that and find out what their situation is, we mentioned the American School of Warsaw. Uh, I hope I've done my part. It, it, it's, it's something that um, obviously everybody the world needs to know about and needs to continue to know about. It's not something that we can just shut out and say, okay, well, that's taken place for two weeks now. And uh, I need to move on with my lives because this really is a problem that is affecting a situation that is affecting the entire world. So thank you everybody for joining me. Um, and again, if you want to shoot me any kind of a, uh, a message, you can also, you can always go to my uh, Facebook page or uh, let's see, I will put that up real quick. Uh, let's see. Here we go. So that's my YouTube channel where I post uh, episodes of me staying in Airbnbs around the country, around the world. And you can also go to my Facebook page right there. And I'd be more than happy to answer questions. So um, thank you again today. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, for those people who had to leave, I will be posting this on my social media channels in its entirety. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you to StreamYard for hosting us on this platform.